Good evening. I purposely said I do not want to see your faces, simply because um, I know there's faces in here of people who will be a little shocked and those who will be sitting there going like this, and then I'll lose track of what I'm saying. I am the second to last speaker, and um, if you notice, no clicker for me. I, I like to tell stories, and I've got three short narratives that I hope will challenge some of the things we think we know, and probably make sure that this evening stands for something. I am a child of Beijing. I am one of those people who can count back to why I'm standing here and why there's a room full of people who paid $100, and most of them women, to come and speak to a room and listen to a room of people like me speak. In 1995, the fourth international conference, United Nations Conference on Women, was held. And when I say I'm a child of Beijing, I consider myself and my generation the last born of Beijing. The first borns are the women who went before us, went before me, and have made it possible for me to be standing here today. Those women include laureate, Nobel laureate Wangari Mathai, Charity Ngilu, Martha Karua, Sally Koske, Zipporah Kitony, women who in Kenya put up with quite a bit of resistance to ensure that young women like me, women like yourselves, and the men in this room were able to say the things we say and for me to have the career I've had. But it's about time that we stopped hanging on to their tailcoats. And the best way I can describe that is by talking about my mother. My mother's probably, if you think about it, it's been 21 years since Beijing. She's a fourth born of Beijing. I'm the last born. And my mother is a woman who I watched go to work when I was seven, eight years old. I saw her learn how to type and take shorthand, Pittman style. I saw her start off her career as a secretary and then an administration manager. And today my mother is a regional HR director for the organization she works for. My mother didn't learn how to drive until she was about 35, 36. And even when she bought her first car, there was a little bit of frowning in the neighborhood, among the family, the in-laws. Today, me buying a car doesn't even begin to feature on the Richter scale. My mother is a woman who got permission from my father to perm her hair. My mother is a child of Beijing. Today, my mother doesn't have black hair. She's got henna red, that color. My mother, for the longest time, wore a shade of red nail polish that was what my father liked. Today, her nails are painted a different color, each and every one of them, because now she does manicures with my daughter. My mother went back to school at the age of 45, got a diploma, a higher diploma, and eventually a degree. Me being able to go to school, go to college, pursue I don't know how many other degrees was not even a thought. It was a done deal. And the only reason I talk about her and the women that went before us, and especially as African and Kenyan women in particular, is that it's about time we stop leaning in. And I'm very aware of the movement that Cheryl Sandberg started, but my friends, we've been leaning in. We're 45 degrees from the floor. If we lean in anymore, we will be flat. Okay? It's time to stand up. It's about time we stood up, stepped up to the opportunities presented to us, and took them. Because actually, the opportunities are there. They've been created for us, and especially for those of us in this room, for the last 21 years. And it's about time we woke up to that reality. The reality that leaning in is not going to cut it anymore. And also the reality that if we do not, as Doki Dongo said, take our place at the table, I'm afraid that the opportunities will begin to shrink, and also the doors will begin to close. We owe it to our daughters and to our younger sisters to stop leaning in. Enough already. Hillary Clinton leaned in for eight years of Barack Obama's presidency. Enough. It's about time we stood up and stepped up. I'm hoping I could come back to this very conversation as I wind up, but I want to tell you a different story. In 2011, I took a trip to Loy Tok Tok with a team from Amref, but this team was from Austria. And there, at the border of Kenya and Tanzania, it's Tanzania, not Tanzania, 
border of Kenya and Tanzania, facing Mount Kilimanjaro, I realized that feminists and men who are feminists actually existed. Allow me to explain. As the Maasai Morans offered us meat served on leaves, as they insisted that we start every discussion that we were there to have by praying towards the mountain, and finished every discussion by praying once again towards the mountain, I learned for the first time that in the Ma community that we were in, in Loi Tok Tok, that they insisted on being in the same room to understand the issues of why do you want our girls to go to school, why can't we have that many children, and why don't you want FGM? Why do you want to stop early child marriages? And the conversations that have been organized by AMREF ensure that the person who was having the conversation with them was a woman, in this case, a young lady called Naiserian. They all called her Nice. And for these Morans, who only spoke Ma, and it's Ma, not Maasai, um, she was their translator. So everything we said in English or Swahili, she told them in Ma. And then when they were done, they told us how amazed and wonderful they were about what she told them and why they implemented it. So my friends, long before Ryan Gosling told us that he was a feminist, long before George Clooney said he was a feminist, they were here on this continent and in this country. We just didn't have a name for them. Pak Loy talked talk for a moment. Let's go to Samburu. I supported a charity called Samburu Women's Trust a couple of years ago. It's because I caught a story on the news about fathers in particular who did one of two things. The slogan was, I support my daughter. I support my daughter to go to school. I support my daughter to actually go as far as she can go. But in Laikipia, a different conversation was happening. If literally the only reason you do not value your daughter's education is because you feel and believe that if you sold her off as a bride, you'd get cattle. A politician in the area actually offered these same men cattle to send their children to school, especially their good daughters. And I usually say what I learned from being outside Nairobi is that cultural problems need cultural solutions, political problems need political solutions. Loi Tok Tok Samburu. And it's not just Kenya. It's a young lady from Pakistan. Her name is Malala. When we hear her story, we tend to remember the men who shot her, and we forget about her father, the man who ensured and told her you will go to school, and who goes everywhere with her around the world, her consistent guardian angel, and, and her biggest cheerleader. But maybe Lord Tok Tok doesn't bring it home about these feminists who exist and don't have fancy names, and don't have big titles, and don't get celebrated in Mary Claire, like John Legend and Barack Obama, but they're there. The other one is my own father. You know, I always tell people who know me very well that the reason I talk more about my mom than my dad is that my dad, bless him, but in his world I can do no wrong. So I usually tell him, Dad, you have no use to me. You never criticize anything. And he's like, it's okay, princess. What do you want to do? Let me explain this. If Facebook came up with a button that could do one click, 100 likes, another click 500 likes, another click 1,000 likes, my dad would be the guy who clicks on the 1,000 likes 10 times. It didn't matter what I said. So long before Will Smith declared he was a feminist, my dad was there. It's just in Kenya and in Kamba, we don't have a word for it. And then I look at my own career. I'm very fortunate I serve on a couple of boards. But when I think back to just the last two months, Every time we end a meeting, and it has happened twice, and I don't know whether any of my fellow directors are here, but the gentlemen in the room tend to say, the women on our board have been awesome. They're not patronizing at all. They're not condescending. They mean it. And they don't even know it, and they're feminists. And lastly, I guess I need to talk about the people who gave me a chance when I was 26 years old to have a job that rules the airwaves. My directors and my managers have probably always been my biggest cheerleaders. I made them a ton of money, but they've been my biggest cheerleaders. And the only reason I bring these stories to you is that for me, it's about time we started having the discussions we want to have as women and include the men in the room. It is imperative that we bring them to the table, we invite them to the room.
What makes me sad is, in Loy Talk Talk, I learn that men are important and they must be included in the conversation, and especially in Africa. In Samburu, I learned this. In my boardroom, I learned this. At home, I learned this. However, a month ago, McKinsey um, Africa had an amazing research that they unveiled. It's called Women Matter Africa. Everybody should read it. But the pushback from the audience as the evening went on is where are the men, the decision makers, the people who need to know that this research says that women matter? Of course, the organizers were very, very gracious. And Bill Russo said, I've heard you, and the next time we do this, I will invite the men. But they were missing. About a week later, on the International Day of the Girl, we were yet in another forum, amazing conversations around girls and keeping them in school. And the Supreme Court judge, who spoke before me, Joki Ndongo, and our chief guest, and a lot of people who spoke asked the same question. We're all here talking about things that need to happen, and the men are not here. Not that they don't care, but they were not invited. My friends, it's about time we invited men to the table. They are willing, they want to hear, they want to help, but they've been locked out. Let me go back to where I began, and this is how I'll end. I am the last born of Beijing, 21 years as a generation. And the women of my generation have come a long way. We have a longer way to go, but it's time to start a new chapter. And that chapter for me will start on the 8th of November in the US. For some strange reason, that great nation never got the memo. They didn't get the memo when Indra Gandhi was president. They didn't get it when Benazir Bhutto was prime minister. They didn't get it as Ireland and Iceland and Finland and Switzerland elected women to the top office in the land. Somehow they didn't get the memo. They didn't get the memo when Kosovo and Serbia and Estonia elected women to the highest office. When the Philippines did it, when their neighbors in Brazil and Argentina had women as presidents. They didn't even get the memo when Africa did it with Malawi, with Liberia, they didn't even get the memo from the Egyptians with Cleopatra. We need to send a memo to the US. It's time, and it's about time, a woman was in the highest office in the land. Not because she's a woman, not because she's running against somebody who's not better than her, but because it's time. And the reason I know the details of the countries from Estonia to Mauritius, and incidentally, somebody needs to check what goes on in San Marino, because the captain regents, very many women. Scary, literally. But it's a good thing. But for some strange reason, we all know that the US, for some reason, impacts the rest of our lives. But I want my daughter, who's five and a half going on 15, with an opinion to boot. I want my goddaughter, who's two years old, to count her years from when Hillary became president. I count everything I have when I look back, because we live life forward and we connect the dots backwards, from Beijing. I am the last born of Beijing. We are the last line, my generation. Everybody after us must look back to a day when a woman occupied the White House. So my message is very simple. In case they didn't get the memo, I'd like to send it out. It's time for a woman to be in the White House. And on the 8th of November, we will be looking for that to happen. Simply because the world will never be the same again. The narrative we tell and the evolution of women and the conversations we have will never be the same again. My daughter's life at five and a half will never be the same again. So my message to Secretary Hillary Clinton is when, not if, when you get to the White House. Make it good. Make it right. Not just because you can, because you can, but because it's about time. Thank you. Good night.